Welcome back everyone. This is the first video covering Chapter 5 from your Operating Systems textbook on concurrency, specifically on mutual exclusion and synchronization. This video will cover Section 1 of Chapter 5 of your textbook on Principles of Concurrency. We'll take a look at the context in which concurrency becomes an issue, uh, some terms related to concurrency, principles of concurrency, the difficulties that concurrency creates for us that we need to figure out how to deal with, and then specifically we'll talk about race conditions and mutual exclusion. Now the central themes of operating system design are all concerned with the management of processes and threads. We have multi-programming, which deals with the management of multiple processes within a uniprocessor system, multi-processing, which deals with the management of multiple processes within a multiprocessor, and distributed processing. Now, this is the management of multiple processes executing on multiple distributed computer systems. Uh, the recent proliferation of clusters is a great example of this type of system. So, when we're talking about the context of concurrency, we're talking about a host of different design issues. Uh, we'll be talking about communication among processes, sharing of and competing for resources like files and input-output access, synchronization of the activities of multiple processes, and allocation of processor time to processes. So concurrency arises in three different contexts. We have multiple applications, uh, and multiprogramming was invented to allow processing time to be dynamically shared among a number of competing and active applications. Uh, we have structured applications. As an extension of the principles of modular design and structured programming, some applications can be effectively programmed as a set of concurrent processes, and even all the way down to operating system structure itself. <clears throat> the same structure advantages can apply to systems programs, and we see that operating systems are themselves often implemented as a set of processes or threads. This slide shows table 5.1, which appears on page 201 in your book. I'm going to ask that you pause the video now and read through this. We want to make sure that we understand all of these terms and the definitions of these terms before we move on. Uh, these are terms that we'll be seeing in, throughout chapters 5 and 6 quite extensively. So again, pause the video, read through this, or pause the video and go to your book read through table 5.1 and please make sure that you understand what these terms are and what they mean. At first glance, it may seem that interleaving and overlapping represent fundamentally different modes of execution and present different problems. In fact, both techniques can be viewed as examples of concurrent processing and both present the same problems. In the case of a uniprocessor, the problems stem from the basic characteristic of multiprogramming systems the relative speed of execution of processes can't be predicted. It depends on the activities of other processes, the way in which the operating system handles interrupts, and the scheduling policies of the operating system. So, concurrency is going to present difficulties for us, just like anything else really in computer science presents difficulties that we need to overcome. It creates problems that we have to figure out how to deal with. Uh, for concurrency, we have the sharing of global resources. So if two processes both want to make use of the same global variable, for example, and both perform reads and writes on that variable, the order in which the various reads and writes are executed is critical. Uh, an example of this problem is uh, shown in the following subsection. We'll be taking a look at this when we take a look at uh, race conditions. Uh, another problem is that it's difficult for the OS to manage the allocation of resources optimally. So if a process wants to request the use of a particular input-output channel, and then it's going to be suspended before using that channel, it might not be the best thing for the operating system to simply lock the channel and prevent its use by other processes. Uh, this is actually something that could lead to deadlock, which we'll be talking about in Chapter 6. Uh, finally, it becomes very difficult to locate a programming error because results are typically not deterministic and easily reproducible. So all of those difficulties present themselves in a multiprocessor system as well as in a uniprocessor system. The same problems occur when we're dealing with multiple processes running on multiple processors. So 
Fundamentally, the problems exist in both uniprocessor and multiprocessor systems. Now, as promised, we'll go ahead and talk about something called a race condition, which is one of the difficulties that can be led to from the use of concurrency. A race condition occurs when multiple processes or threads read and write data items so that the final result depends on the order of execution of instructions in the multiple processes. So, as a first little example, let's suppose that two processes share the same global variable A. Uh, this is uh, the example that was brought up on the last slide. At some point in its execution, the first process updates A to value 1. And at some point in its, ex it, its own execution, the second process updates A to the value 2. Thus, the two tasks are in a race to write variable A. In this example, the loser of the race, uh, which is the process that updates last, determines the final value of A. For another example, let's consider two processes, process 3 and process 4, that share global variables B and C, with the initial values B equals 1 and C equals 2. At some point in its execution, process 3 executes B equals B plus C. So we're just going to add B and C and assign that value to B. At some point in the execution, process 4 assigns the value B plus C to C. So these two processes update different variables, but the final value of the two variables depend on the order in which the two processes execute. If process 3 executes its assignment first, then the final values are b equals 3 and z equals 5. If process 4 executes its assignment first, then the final values are b equals 4 and c equals 3. So race conditions can cause us a lot of problems when we have multiple processes that are trying to do things to various global resources at the same time. Uh, take a look at Appendix A in your book, which includes a discussion of race conditions uh, using semaphores as an example to gain a better understanding of what's going on with race conditions. So what design and management issues are raised by the existence of concurrency? Uh, first of all, the operating system has to be able to keep track of various processes and it does this with the use of process control blocks, or PCBs, that we described in Chapter 4. Uh, secondly, the operating system has to allocate and deallocate various resources for each active process, because sometimes multiple processes are going to want access to the same resource, such as processor time, memory, files, and input-output devices. Thirdly, the operating system has to protect the data and physical resources of each process against unintended interference by other processes. So, <clears throat> again, this is the kind of thing where we have to worry about things like race conditions. We have to protect resources to, from interference and from different things happening at the same time with different processes that can have unintended effects. And we have to deal with the functioning of a process and the output it produces has to be independent of the speed at which its execution is carried out relative to the speed of other processes. And that's the subject that we're dealing with in this chapter. Now this slide shows table 5.2 on page 206 in your book. And uh, <clears throat> what we're doing here is classifying the ways in which processes interact on the basis of the degree to which they're aware of each other's existence. So several options are we've got processes that are unaware of each other, so these are independent processes that are not intended to work together. Processes is indirectly aware of each other uh, are processes that are not necessarily aware of each other by their respective PIDs, but share access to some object like an I.O. buffer. Uh, and these processes are going to exhibit cooperation in the sharing of the common object. And finally, we have processes that are directly aware of each other. These are processes that are able to communicate with each other via their PIDs, and that are designed to work jointly on some activity. So concurrent processes can come into conflict when they're competing for the use of the same resource like memory, processor time, I.O. buffers, etc. This is where we run into the problems that crop up when we're using concurrent processes. In the case of competing processes, we've got three control problems that we have to deal with. Mutual exclusion, deadlock, and starvation. So where we need mutual exclusion is when two or more processes need access to a single non-shareable resource. And that's very important. It's a, we're talking about resources that can't be used by more than one program at a time. 
So when we have a resource that cannot be used by more than one process or one program at any given time, we call that resource a critical resource. And when we're dealing with programming, the part of a program, so the code that uses a critical resource, is called the critical section of the code. And only one program at a time can access this code because, of course, the, that code deals with accessing a critical resource. So we can only have one process at a time in the critical section of its code. Now, some of you have been working on Assignment 6. Uh, some of you are about to start working on Assignment 6. And that's what Peterson's algorithm is about. Peterson's algorithm guarantees mutual exclusion. So this is what you'll be dealing with in Assignment 6. So let's take a look at the requirements for a proper implementation of mutual exclusion. First of all, it has to be enforced, no matter what. There's no halfway measures here. When we have mutual exclusion, it has to be an all or nothing thing. So we have to enforce mutual exclusion when we use it. A process that halts has to do so without interfering with other processes. So the whole point of mutual exclusion is to make sure that processes can execute independently and access shared resources without interfering with each other. We can't have deadlock or starvation, which we'll take a look at in the next couple slides. Um, a process must not be denied access to a critical section when there's no other processes using it. So if the critical section of code is not in use by any other process and a particular process wants to access that code, it has to be allowed to. Uh, there are no assumptions made about relative process speeds or number of processes, which is what allows us our scalability on multiprocessor or even in unit-processor systems. And a process remains inside its critical section for a finite time only. This is really important because otherwise we're going to have a critical resource that lots of different processes need that they'll never ever be able to get access to if an individual process remains in its critical section forever. So let's talk about deadlock. This is a problem that crops up when we're dealing with mutual exclusion enforcement. And basically what happens is two or more processes need access to multiple resources at the same time. So if none of them can get all of the resources that they need, but they don't release the resources they have periodically, then none of them can move forward. So let's take a look at an example. If we have two processes, process one and process two, that both need access to two variables, say two global variables, variable A and variable B. If process one has locked variable A and process two has locked variable B, and neither one of them releases its the resource that it currently has locked, then neither process can ever get both of the resources that it needs to move forward, and both processes just hit a brick wall. They stop, those processes are deadlocked, and so that's something we have to be aware of when we're dealing with concurrent programming and something that we have to take into account to make sure that that doesn't happen and lock those processes up so that they can never make any progress. Now, another problem that we run into with mutual exclusion is the concept of starvation. This happens when multiple processes need periodic access to a resource. So let's say we have a resource R and three processes, P1, P2, and P3, that all are going to need access to that resource R periodically. So in a scenario where, let's say, process 1 gets access to R, does its thing, then it releases R, and process 3 gets access, does its thing, releases resource R, and then P1 gets it again, we could have a situation where P1 gets it, P3 gets it, P1 gets it, P3 gets it, but if P2, if process 2 never actually gets access, because it has too low a priority or just the timing doesn't work out, we could actually have a situation where process two never gets access and never gets to make any kind of forward progress. In that case, we say that process two is suffering from starvation. So we have to be careful about this as well. We need to make sure that every process that needs a particular resource gets access to it at some time. Otherwise, we can have tons and tons of processes that are doing just fine, doing what they need to do, but we can have a subset of the processes running on a system that can never make any progress because they can never get access to a particular resource. So that does it for section one of chapter five in your book. In our next video, we'll be taking a look at section 5.3,
where we'll take a look at some common congruency mechanisms and specifically a mechanism called semaphores.